Sorry, I got lost. I wasn't sure where I was supposed to be. I thought there was a group that was supposed to be doing this. No? Well, what are we talking about? You. We're doing Monty Python. What do you want to know? <laughs> Um, I've been doing it since uh, 93, I started, uh, or 91 rather. I started recording in 91, it went on Fox originally, on prime time, as Batman the Animated Series, and then um, that evolved into uh, The Adventures of Batman and Robin, and then uh, The Justice League, and then Batman and Beyond, Good show. and um, so there were four different shows that grew out of that one job. And um, now uh, I've been doing the games, uh, Arkham City, and sure. first Arkham Asylum, and now uh, just this week I've released uh, Arkham City. I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen it yet? Yeah. I've yet to play it. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? Yeah, it's because I've signed. And um, what a lot of people don't know is that when the, uh, Batman first was done, um, Warner Brothers spent twice as much per half hour as had previously been spent on animation. So that um, that's why the show looked so rich. Um, they, they literally had a full symphony score. They had um, uh, some of the best artists um, that could be had in LA. Um, a, a very large cast. They were just throwing money at the show. I had friends working at Disney who said, damn you, you know, made us all look so bad now. You raised the bar. So, um, it's been a great job to work on. And it's the first animated job I ever did. It's the first uh, one I ever auditioned for. Sure. So it was a very lucky break. Uh, anyone have any questions? Yep. I heard an interview a little while ago with Andrea Romano. Yeah. And she said when you first, you did your, your first cast in Batman, you had an al sort of analogy with Batman's character to being like a Shakespearean character. Yeah. Like Hamlet. Did you sort of elaborate on that? Well, you know, you always actors always talk about their instrument, and their instrument is who they are. It's it's who you are. It's your background. It's everything that's led up to where you are now. All the training and all of your life experiences. That's all you have. And um, my background, I, I was trained at Juilliard uh, as a classically trained actor. I worked for Joe Papp at the Public Theater. I did a lot of Shakespeare. I toured around the country in Broadway productions and and um, did uh, Greek tragedies and Shakespeare. I had a sort of an old-fashioned theatrical training, classical theatrical training. So when I went in for this, I, I had really, really very little background in um, cartoons, and certainly not in Batman. So when I went in, I, I said, well, they said, do you know anything about it? And they said, well, you know, the Bruce Wayne, the Bruce of uh, the um, Adam West uh, Batman from the 70s. They said, no, 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 we're not going in that direction. That's too cartoony. We're doing the Dark Knight series, and they described it to me. A, a man who lost his parents when he was a child. He spent his life avenging their death. Um, he has two personalities. He's misunderstood. He's, I said, I said he's, he's Hamlet. I said, you're telling the Hamlet story. And they said, well, no one's ever said that before. But I said, well, let me just give it a shot. So I put myself in the head of of what I thought that kind of pain, that childhood pain would be. And as I got closer to the pain, deeper into the pain, I just came up with this very dark, husky voice that, as the, as the more I did it, the more they, I saw them in the sound of all started moving around really fast. And I thought, well, I either did something really wrong <laughs> or really right. <laughs> and uh, it was just a lucky, uh, a lucky break. And that was 20 years ago. Yeah? Yeah, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Adam. You mentioned Adam with, and um, there was an episode the Where the Great Goes, right. where at Adam West had a role, and how was it um, act, the acting alongside the side him? That's a good question. Yeah, I was asking what it was like to work with Adam West. And what was interesting was, you know, actors get identified with roles. And when you come into it later, it's a little bit of like stepping on someone else's toes. You know, you, you're sort of nervous about, you know, 
this is territory he had claimed that he'd gotten so much of his identity from. And here I was, this young Fisher, coming along and sort of doing the role. So I said, um, I was kind of, you know, I said, yeah, it's nice to meet you. And, um, he said, look, it's very cool. He, he sensed the tension in the air. He said, it's very cool. He said, have a great time. He said, I had a great time running with it. The ball's in your court now. You should have as much fun as you want. And then he did that great, great performance as the Grey Ghost. He's a really talented guy. And um, so he, he couldn't have been nicer. And now there are other actors doing the voice in subsequent Batman shows, you know. So, um, so you know, the, the torch gets passed. Yeah? Yeah? Can you tell us about the, uh, you've got a new uh, uh, Batman Justice League project coming up, haven't you? Uh, Doom? Uh, oh, next year? There's a new movie coming out, Justice League Doom. And um, it's, it's really, it's, I don't want to give it away. You know, I can't talk a lot about it because it'll ruin it for you. <laughs> but the, the idea is that Batman, he's a, what, what makes Batman unique among all the superheroes and what makes audiences really, I think, identify with him is that he has no superpowers. He's just a guy who, he's kind of like the, the original MacGyver. <laughs> Isn't he? He's got to invent these great tools, and he's got to use his wits to get out of things. He has no super strength, he has no superpowers, he doesn't fly, he can't, you know. So, um, being such a smart guy, he realized that if any of the Justice League ever went rogue, no one would ever be able to stop them, because they are superheroes. So, he had to have something on each one of them that could stop them that he could use against them, if he ever had to. And he has it locked away in a computer. And the theory behind Justice League Doom is that someone gets into that computer. Huh? I won't say. A mysterious someone gets into the computer and steals the code. And then Batman has to get it back. And um, of course, saves the world. <laughs> but um, but it's it's very interesting because all the Justice League is threatened by Batman screw up, basically, giving you know getting this information that no one else would have ever gotten, and but keeping it a secret, and then it gets stolen. So he has to correct um, a mistake that he sort of laid the groundwork for, you know. But he does, so it all works out. Yeah. Um, you sort of already touched on a bit with the, the Hamlet uh, analogy, but I mean, you've been described a lot as the definitive voice of Batman in some ways because you walk the edge of that darkness that is so desperately Batman. Uh, how do you how do you grapple with that? Where do, where do you feel that Batman is sort of soul sits? That's a, that's a really um, powerful question because it goes it goes to why does Batman resonate with audiences so much? Uh, why are you all here? Why has this story lasted so long? Why is it the biggest single franchise character in Hollywood? DC. You realize that? It's a huge franchise. And I think it has to do with the fact Batman, we all relate to him. Because everyone has a private face and a public face. Everybody does. A, a face they present to the world and a more intimate private face that they keep secret. And we're all always trying to reconcile those two faces. And in Batman, you have them completely personified. He's living out both of them. So everyone can relate to that. And everyone can also relate to the fact that he's correcting the pain of his youth by trying to save the world. I think everyone would like to believe that if they saw a child in the street and a truck coming, that they would throw themselves in front of the truck to save that child. You'd like to believe that about yourself. But you also fear in the back of your mind that you'd hesitate because you don't want to get hit by a truck. Everyone wants to preserve themselves. And we're all torn by that 
those two two tugs of wanting to save the world or wanting to save someone, but also wanting to preserve our own life. And Batman always throws himself in front of the truck. And it's, that's very inspiring for people. It gets you to live out that fantasy of, I want to save the world, you know? Um, so, I think that's why he resonates with audiences so much. Um, that's why the story has lasted so long. Um, that's the power of, of the legend. About Does that answer some of the questions? Yeah. Yeah, back there. <laughs> um, do you ever miss playing Batman even between the Batman the anime series uh, and the uh, Batman and Robin between Arkham Asylum and Arkham City? Do you ever miss playing mm -hmm. Batman even miss working with the people who d were involved in Batman? Oh, sure. It really becomes a family after a while. Because Mark, you may have heard, may not be doing the Joker anymore. And, uh, I hate that fact. It was good. I keep thinking it's just a negotiation <laughs> thing going on, and I hope it is. But, um, um, yeah, I've been working with the same people for, for 20 years, on and off. And, uh, and in between uh, jobs, I, I really miss everybody. I get together with Andrea periodically, I get together with Mark periodically. Uh, but then when the game came up, you know, it was like, you know, kids going back into playground together. There's something about knowing the same people for so long. You just know how each other works. There's no getting to know you stage. You know, those first few days on any project where you're kind of feeling out the other actors. How do they work? Are they generous? Are they selfish? Are they, you know, is, there, is he a diva? You know, that kind of thing. And um, Andre is really great about picking people who really play together well. People who are generous. So um, it's, it's been a... It's been a a joy to be a part of. So yeah, I miss it between kids. Yeah, right here. Um, I was wondering, given your expertise of um, playing Batman in the miniseries and everything in the in the supernatural versions of the Batman story that you've been doing for the past twenty years, given that what um, I was wondering if you could give us your opinions on Christopher Nolan's movies and their you know, different, more realistic take. On Batman Cabin. Oh, I think he's fantastic. I think that his going back to the Dark Knight um, epic is is terrific. I think that um, Christian Bale has been the closest to being an on-camera Batman as anyone's come up with. A lot of people have issue with the voice that he does. Um, I know, but but other than that, <laughs> other than that. He's fantastic. He's really, you know, he's really terrific. And Christopher, Chris, uh, Christopher Nolan is such a talented director. So yeah, I think it's beautiful. And I think going back to that, the Dark Knight stuff, and getting away from the cartooniness of some of the other films, um, I think is great. Yeah, right here. With the uh, original animated series, um, being the voice actor, did you have any say script-wise in any of the episodes? Did you get a chance to work with Paul Dini, Paul Dini or Bruce Tin about you know reading the script and then thinking, oh, maybe Bruce wouldn't do this, or you know, did you have an impact <laughs> every now and then? <laughs> you wouldn't ask that if you knew Bruce Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Tim is is a very inspired, very very creative guy who's enormously confident. You know, he knows what he wants. That being said, um, after so many years, he would occasionally, in exasperation, say, oh, God, oh God, we can't think of what he'd say. What would he say? You know what he would say. What would he say? <laughs> or if they'd give me a line and I'd say, you know, this is just bad. This is, Batman would never do this. You know, so never say this. So, it got to the point after a couple of years of their trusting me enough where that would come up. But Bruce is one of the most confident people I've ever worked with. He's, he's an artist, and a very temperamental artist. He has a very short fuse. So you can't really tell him what to do, as much as I might like.
Back there? Hey, Kevin, how you doing? How's it going? Really good, thank you. Um, I heard a story online, and I want to ask you if it's true, um, and I'm a little bit nervous asking because I don't want to ruin the illusion, but I heard that you lived pretty close um, to the World Trade Center back in 9-11, uh, and you helped out down there. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, I heard you uh, did something really inspiring, and I'd like you to share it with the audience. Well, that's nice of you to, to call it inspiring. It wasn't inspiring, but it's a funny story. It's a funny story to share. Um, but it's not an inspiring story, believe me. Um, I live in New York, I live in Manhattan, and everybody, you know, if, if um, Melbourne were attacked, I'm sure all of you would do everything you could to, um, to, to help. And that's what happened in New York. New York's a really, it's a city of neighborhoods, and for any of you who've never been there. Um, it's, it's like a big, big, small town. And everyone has a really strong identity with New York. So, after the attack, first, the, the, what you've seen on camera is the footage of everyone running away from the clouds of debris. And it's terrifying. What I wish some cameras had pictured were once the debris had settled, were the mobs of people who ran back. And there were a lot of people who ran back. So many that they had too many volunteers who were digging through everything. So they set up a, a phone line to call. And so I went to the Javits Center, and they turned me away. They said, we don't, we don't need any more volunteers. So I called this number, and they said, no, we have all the diggers we need. We have all the tunnelers we need. We have everything we need. He said, this one guy said, you know what we need? He said, we, we've set up a huge kitchen to feed all the workers. He said, well, what we really need are people with restaurant experience. Do you have any restaurant experience? I said, I'm an actor. <laughs> of course I have restaurant experience. <laughs> I said, what do you need? You need a server, you need a cook. He said, you cook? I said, yeah, I've, 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 I've done cooking in kitchens when I was in Juilliard. He said, well, do you have time? I said, I have time right now. He said, I mean right now, like now. Can you get down here tonight for the night shift? I said, yes, I can do the night shifts for the next couple of weeks. He said, please come right here. So I get down there to a place called Nino's Restaurant, and it was this huge Italian restaurant just a couple of blocks from the, the uh, pit. And... Um, uh, they had taken it over and they commandeered it, and I did the night shifts from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, and after a few nights, and it was, you know, you can imagine what Lower Manhattan was like then. It still smelled very sulfurous. The air was still very cloudy. Um, there were these huge Klieg lights set up all around the um, So it was almost like a, a, a movie set. Um, so all night, it was this bright, stark white light. And all these relief workers, um, thousands of them, would stream into this massive kitchen, um, dining hall, and we were back in the kitchen just churning out food, just churning out food, and people would come in, and there would be a dinner service, and then there would be snacks in the middle of the night, and there would be a breakfast service. And it was a really warm September. And so even in the middle of the night, we were all sweaty, and we'd go outside and hang out in the front. And I was working in the kitchen, and after about three nights of this, everyone was really... It, there was a lot of silence in this massive dining hall. All you heard was mumbling and a rumble, and everyone was being very quiet. It, it, it was, it was a, there was a sadness. I called it the great sadness, when the sadness descended on Lauren and Adam. And after about three nights, I was working in the kitchen, and this guy next to me says, who had also been working with me every night, he goes, so... Uh, my day job is I'm an architect. He says, what's your day job? And I said, well, I'm an actor. 